Hi, this is Matt, the Game Explainer. Um, today I'm going to be showing you Dinosaur Island. It's a brand new game from Pandasaurus Games for one to four players, designed by Jonathan Gilmore and Brian Lewis. Now, um, right up front, I want to just let you know that this is um, the deluxe version of the game, which was available through Kickstarter. There's um, some slight component differences uh, between this version here and the retail version, so I'll try to call those out as I show you the game. But otherwise, the two versions of the game play exactly the same. Now, um, in this game, um, as you can imagine from the name, Dinosaur Island, um, the theme of the game is each player is managing his or her own dinosaur theme park or like a Jurassic Park, right? Um, so you're going to uh, build dinosaur exhibits and uh, create dinosaurs by combining DNA. Um, you're going to be able to purchase other attractions like rides, food vendors, and merchandise, you know, um, uh, operations. Um, you're going to be able to um, buy uh, upgrades for your lab, which will give you different actions that you can perform in your lab on your turn. Um, and then, of course, um, you're going to have visitors come to visit your park um, on your park board each round, and you're going to get income and victory points from those visitors. Um, so while you're going to get some victory points uh, during the game from visitors, you're also going to be angling for end game victory points in the form of these objective cards over here. Um, and you're also going to get end game points from every dinosaur that you create and also from some of your other attractions. Um, also, at the end of the game, each $5 is worth one victory point. So it's one of those kind of games where you play round after round until the end game is triggered. And then um, add up your end game points, and whoever has the most points is the winner. Now, the really cool thing about this game, though, is how these end game objective cards work. Uh, the game comes with three decks of cards. Short, uh, short game, medium game, and long game. And so right up front, before you even start the game, the players can decide what length of game they want to play. So regardless of the number of players, you can choose to do a short game, which will be roughly an hour. Um, you can do a medium game, maybe an hour and a half or so, and a long game will be rough, you know, around two hours. That's going to vary obviously a little bit based on the number of players and also based on exactly which objective cards are in play. Uh, but let me show you an example of a you know, couple of those objective cards. Um, so, for example, um, like here, you've got, um, so if I can get to focus on the card here, um, earn $12 from patrons in a single round. So patrons are the people that come to your park and, you know, pay you money to get into your park. Um, they can also, uh, you can also earn money from some of your attractions. So if you're able to earn $12 in a single round from patrons, then you would claim this objective. Now, if more than one player um, achieves this objective in the same phase of the same round, then they both get to claim it. They're both going to score seven points at the end of the game. But once a, a objective card, an objective card is claimed by anybody, then that card can no longer be claimed by anybody for the rest of the game. Uh, another example is buy four lab upgrades, right? So once a player has purchased four lab upgrades, you know, they get to claim this card. So what happens is the game continues round after round until um, all but one of these objective cards um, have been claimed by one or more players. Um, once that um, is triggered, that triggers the end game. You're going to finish that round to, to its completion, and then the game is over. So players have to be aware of what the end game objectives are and um, be I mean, hopefully competing and, and angling to try and achieve those objectives before the other players, but also just be aware of when the end, end game is going to be triggered. So based on um, the number of players, you put out um, one more objective card than the number of players, and that's how you get going. So I like the, uh, the ability in this game to tune the length of the game based on how you want, short, medium, or long. That's very nice. Um, another thing that's kind of unique to this game that I've seen are these plot twist cards. So it comes with a deck of plot twists, and um, again, uh, at the start of the game, you draw two plot twist cards from the deck, and then these change the rules up a little bit for that play, you know, for that um, session of the game. So, for example, each player may hire one additional specialist during the game. So, specialists are these cards over here that you can um, purchase. You hire them, and then you get special abilities from them. They can also give you extra lab workers to 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 help you with your lab actions. Um, normally, you're limited to only having three active specialists at any one time. But if this plot twist was in play for the game, now you can have every player can have four. 
uh, specialists. So again, it changes up the game a little bit, changes up the rules slightly, and uh, ensures that each time you sit down to play the game, it's going to be a, just a little bit different. So I like those plot twists quite a bit. Um, so let me explain kind of what you see in front of you, and then I'm going to take the camera and zoom in on each board to explain kind of each phase of the game. Um, each player will have a, a two boards in front of them, a lab board, which is here, and then a, a park board over here. And the lab board is where you're going to keep track of um, the DNA that you currently have in cold storage. The, and there's six different types of DNA. I'll show you this board cl more closely, but you can probably see there's six different colored tracks here. Um, and you can gain DNA throughout the game and then spend that DNA to create dinosaurs. Um, you're also on this lab board are going to track your actions that you perform in the lab phase as well as your park's threat level and security level. So one of the concepts in the, in the game is every time you create a dinosaur and add it into your park, that dinosaur is going to increase the overall threat level of your park. And uh, then during the park phase, when the visitors come in and you place them around in the various places in your park, if you haven't purchased enough security and maintained your security level to be at least equal to your threat level, then some of the dinosaurs are going to break out of their paddocks and eat some of your guests. And that's going to cost you some victory points. So, um, you know, typically you don't want that to happen, but it is, an, you know, it is a way uh, for the game to kind of uh, allow you to influence the player order from round to round. Because um, each round of the game, um, at the end of each round, we're going to reorder the player order from least victory points to most victory points. So if you've ever played games like Power Grid, where, you know, they reorder the player order um, based on how everybody's doing, um, that's what this game does as well. Now, um, the park board, of course, is where you're going to place all your dinosaur exhibits and your live dinosaurs um, and any other attractions that you've purchased during the game. It's also where you're going to, uh, you know, place your visitors out um, at, uh, during each round. Then there are several common boards. There's the research board over here. That's the first phase of the round is the research phase. The second phase of the round is the market phase, which happens on this blue board and these, these other uh, tokens and cards over here. This board over here is simply used to track each uh, player's park's excitement level. Um, and so every time you create a dinosaur or uh, for some of your attractions, they're going to increase the excitement level of your park. And the excitement level is going to determine how many visitors come to your park each round. So obviously by creating more dinosaurs and adding more things into your park, it will raise your excitement level and you'll be able to attract more visitors. And remember, visitors typically will give you money and victory points every round. So that's another thing you want to manage is your park's excitement level. And then, of course, the victory points are tracked in the purple section here um, uh, on this board and then player order as well. So those are all the boards that you see. And again, the, the order of each game round is research phase, then market phase, then lab phase, and then park phase. And then at the end of each round, there's a cleanup phase and you move right into the next round. So it's actually for having a lot of stuff on the table. And as you can see, you need a lot of table space to play a four player game of this. Uh, this is about a four foot by four foot table. And it, as you can see, it comfortably takes up most of the table. But um, the game itself is very easy to play and very easy to follow because I think thematically almost everybody understands the concept of Jurassic Park, right? Um, and because the phases go from one board to the next, to the next, to the next, it's very easy to kind of follow what's going on um, as you go through the game round. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, switch to handheld mode here and um, kind of show you the different phases of the round, okay? Okay, so this is the research board. Again, this is phase one of the round. And what I'm showing you here, um, these um, uh, pieces here, these are uh, scientists. Each player has three scientists in the game, numbered one through three. Now in the deluxe version, they are these kind of plastic beakers, um, but in the retail version, you get these cardboard tokens, okay? So I just kind of wanted to show an example of a retail version versus deluxe version. Now. In this phase, players are going to take turns placing one of their scientists at a time onto this research board and performing an action. Um, your actions are you can claim one of these DNA dice. Now these DNA dice, as you can hopefully see, are really, really awesome. They're amber colored to be, you know, like amber um, from the, the Jurassic Park movie. 
Um, and what will happen is there are, I think, 10 dice come with the game, and you're going to use a number of dice equal to, um, I think it's two times the number of players plus one. And you choose the dice randomly from the box at the start of the game, and then those are the dice you use for the rest of the game. Uh, at the start of each round, the start player will roll the dice and then place them on this track up here. Now, it doesn't matter what the order is. Now, these dice will give you different uh, combinations of DNA, okay? So let me show you the lab board real quick here. So again, you can see the types of DNA. There are three basic DNA, um, these colors here, and then there are three advanced DNA, these colors here. Um, each player starts the game with one of each basic DNA, no advanced DNA, and these black cubes represent your current cold storage um, amounts. So you can only store a maximum of three uh, basic DNA each and one advanced DNA each at the start of the game. There are ways to increase cold storage um, and then you would just move these black markers up. Okay, so that's the idea of the DNA. And again, the DNA is used to create dinosaurs. So if you look at a dinosaur recipe here, like this Tyrannosaurus Rex, um, it requires one of the blue, the purple, two green, and a hot pink, if you will. Um, so for each if T-Rex that you want to create, you'd have to spend that mix of DNA, right? So you can kind of understand how the economy works in the game. You know, you're getting DNA from the dice, and then you're spending DNA to build your dinosaurs. Now, to claim a DNA die, you're going to take one of your lab workers, okay, and you're going to place it by the die, and, and then just, you know, claim the die. Now, the cool thing is, the number of the scientist is multiplied by the number of DNA on the die. So if you were to take this die, this hot pink one, you gain one hot pink times two would equal two hot pink. Now, of course, if you don't have enough space in your cold storage, then you just you wouldn't you only collect what you what you can store. So you have to manage that. Um, some of the dice, like this one here, um, has two kind of uh, wild basic DNA. You see it's got the three colors of the basic DNA on it. So when you collect this die, if I were to collect this with my number two, it'd be two times two it would be four basic DNA of any type. If I wanted this die, it's got three of the light blue, I would do two times three is six of the light blue DNA. So you get the idea. Um, so it's a really nice, interesting um, idea of having different powered workers and then multiplying by the DNA on the dice. Now, there are a couple special symbols you're going to see on some of the dice. Um, there's an extra lab worker, and this is upgrading your paddock um, in one of your dinosaur exhibits. If you want to claim either of these two dice, you must use your most powerful scientist, which is the number three. This is the only way you can claim one of those two dice, okay? And upgrading a paddock, if you notice on each dinosaur exhibit, it comes with a size one paddock, which means you can store one dinosaur in there, um, when you create your first dinosaur of that type. But if you wanted to, for example, create a second uh, T-Rex in this exhibit, you would first need to upgrade the size of your paddock. And that's where these um, tiles come in. Normally they have a cost. The cost is equal to the size of the paddock. But if you were to able to get you know, this die, which is a free upgrade, then you would immediately upgrade one of your paddocks you know, in your park down here to the next size up for free. Okay, so that's kind of nice. Um, so these are special dice symbols that, you know, you might or might not see during the game, depending on the dice that are uh, chosen at the start of the game. So that's one of the actions, getting, you know, DNA or sometimes, you know, special benefits. Um, if you want to claim one of these dinosaur exhibits here, then you have to use, um, there's always going to be three available each round, an herbivore, a small carnivore, and a large carnivore. The herbivore you can claim with any scientist, so minimum of a number one. The small carnivore requires at least a level 2 scientist, and the large carnivore requires your level 3 scientist only. So again, there's decisions to be made in this phase as to which scientists to use where. Once a dinosaur exhibit is taken, it is not replenished until the end of the game round. So there's only ever three exhibits available each round. Finally, you can come here to increase the cold storage on your lab board. And again, based on the you know, number of the scientists that you place there, you get to increase the cold storage by that amount across any combination of DNA on your lab board. Right? And finally, you can also choose to pass with one of your scientists, or any number of your scientists, during this phase. When you pass with a scientist, you take that scientist and you add them to your lab board into your pool of lab workers. 
So it allows you to have extra lab workers for that round of the game. And sometimes that can be really, really handy because sometimes you just really don't want any more dinosaur exhibits or you don't really need any more DNA uh, or increasing cold storage, but you really want to do a lot of lab actions that round so you can bring your scientists down here and use them there. So we'll go through the player order three times, um, you know, placing our scientists and resolving that phase. Then we go to the market phase, which is phase two. Um, that happens on this blue board. And what happens is there's always going to be uh, 12 items in the tableau out here at di four different price levels, two, three, four, and five, as you can see across the row. So if you want to purchase something in a row, you pay that cost and you take the item. So we're going to cycle through the player order two times during phase two. Each time the player can purchase one thing from the market. Now, there are three kinds of things available. There are exhibits, which are these green tiles. There are lab upgrades and specialists. Now, the exhibits all have a price on them. So, for example, um, this Clever Grill, ha, 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 um, which is like a food vendor, it has a cost of 11 and it can hold up to four visitors every round. And because it's a food vendor, each of these visitors can get you either $2 or one victory point if you place them on this tile in your park. But the cost of this Clever Grill is not just $11, but it's 11 plus whatever um, row it's in in the market. Okay, so if you um, wanted to buy this right now, it would cost 16 The lab upgrades and the specialists just cost whatever row they're in. Now, there's some basic actions also available here. You can always just buy DNA. Um, for example, two basic DNA for $2 all the way down to two advanced DNA for $5. If you choose to do one of these purchase DNA actions, then you also discard one of the items from that row. So it is a way to deny other players a little bit um, some of the items that may be in the market. There's also two other um, standard upgrades that are available to all players. Um, if you look at your lab board again, there are two um, kind of basic actions here. I apologize for the glare, um, but you can do uh, DNA refinement and dino research. Okay, and these are your kind of two basic actions that start here. And you can upgrade those actions by buying these tiles for $3 and $5 respectively. You can also pass on your action during phase two to earn $2. So we'll cycle through the player order twice and then the market phase is done. Then we're going to come down to the lab phase. So every player has their own lab board, and the lab phase all happens simultaneously, which is really nice. So all players are basically just going to take their workers, right, plus maybe any lab workers that they, or sorry, um, scientists that they brought down from the first phase of the, of the round, and they're going to um, take, you know, basically take Daryl's workers and put them on these worker placement spots in whatever order you want. Um, you do have to resolve one action at a time, though. And then once you're done with all of your workers, then we move on to phase four. So in phase three, you know, like I said, you can um, do DNA refinement, which is combining two basic DNA to get an advanced DNA. Um, you can also create a dinosaur, which... Um, the first time you do it is one guy, and then it costs you two guys to do it the second time. So if you wanted to create two dinosaurs this round, you'd have to spend a total of three guys. Now that's where like you know this create one dinosaur upgrade is nice because you can do it three times in a round and only require a total of three guys. Um, you also have a couple more action spaces here. You can upgrade your paddock size or increase the security level by one. Both of those cost money. Um, we showed you the paddock upgrade earlier. You can upgrade to a level four paddock. So each of your dinosaur exhibits can hold up to four dinosaurs. And the reason you want to upgrade is um, each dinosaur exhibit will attract one visitor per dinosaur. So at the start of the game, you have one dinosaur, you know, in your park, uh, in your basic exhibit. So you're going to attract one visitor to here, and you can attract one visitor to your hats um, store. Okay, and that's it. That's all you got in your park at the start of the game. So you're going to have to very quickly either you know, expand this um, dinosaur exhibit to hold more dinosaurs or start buying more um, uh, attractions and getting more dinosaur exhibits uh, from the market. But um, in any case, so you can, you know, like I said, you can also increase security, which costs money over here. The higher your security level, the more money it costs to increase it. 
And again, you want to keep your security. If you don't want any of your visitors to get eaten by dinosaurs, you want your security to be equal to or greater than the threat level of your park um, each round. Now, the one little wild card with security, or sorry, with the threat level, is after phase one is complete and these dice have been claimed by players, if there are any leftover dice on the track, then you're going to take the die with the highest number of these little circular pips on it because these pips represent um, threat. Okay, so if this die was left over, it would go over onto this spot here. And th what it means is that all players, when they're determining the threat level of their park for the round, they're going to have to add three threat to their threat level. So, you know, let's say you had, you had created a, a second one of these, you know, basic dinosaurs in the first round, which b would bump your threat level up by one. Because if you look, it's got a single pip. So each one of these little dinosaurs increases your threat level by one. It also is going to give you one victory point at the end of the game, and it's going to increase your excitement level by one, right? But if your threat was two on the track this round, and there was a three pip die over here, then your total threat for this round is actually five, right? So you would consider it to be here. So if you're not doing anything to increase your security level, you're going to have a lot of your visitors eaten this round, which is going to cost you victory points. Because for every uh, one... Um, level that your threat is higher than your security, that means one of your visitors is eaten, right? So if this was effectively down here and my security was up here, I would have one, two, three, four eaten visitors this round, which is not so great, okay? So that's how that total threat calculation works. You don't actually move the marker, you know, for the die. You just mentally add the three pips to your total threat. Okay, so you really have to manage security. That's something you're going to have to spend money on to get that up. Um, but you can do that here in this unlimited number of workers. You can also raise money by doing a venture capital actions, $3, $2, and $1. These two spots are open at the start of the game, um, therefore being able to add these lab upgrades as you buy them. So, for example, like Dino, we were talking about security. I could add, if I bought that Dino security upgrade, I could add it there. And now I can increase my security level by one for no cost with this guy, and I can put two more guys to increase it for no cost again. You know, so that might be a nice one to get early on if you if you can get it. Um, so anyway, all players are going to do their actions simultaneously. Though when everybody's done with their actions in the lab, then you move on to the park phase, which is over here, phase four. Okay, and in this phase, each player in player order is going to draw a number of workers from this bag, which awesome bag comes with the game, and um, then you're going to determine based on the visitors that you draw how many, uh, how much income you get from those visitors and how many victory points you get. And you're also going to determine if and how many of your visitors get eaten by your dinosaurs. So I'm going to replace the camera um, and uh, and show you how that works. But before I do that, I just want to show that you know each player also has some corporation tokens that they use, you know, like to claim objective cards. So if you complete an objective, you put it there. Um, there's also, of course, money that comes with the game. Uh, the deluxe version has these uh, metal coins, and the deluxe version has um, cardboard ones, okay? And these metal coins are amazing. They're about as thick as a standard poker chip. They're super heavy, painted on one side, and then they have skulls on the other. They're really, really cool. Um, okay, so let me replace the camera and show you the park phase. Okay, so I've zoomed in on one of the park boards here, and I've set it up um, just to kind of show you an example. It's not necessarily a true-to-life example, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how the visitors work. So um, right at this point, I've got a dinosaur exhibit with three dinosaurs in it. I've upgraded my paddock to a size three. Um, I've purchased the gift shop here and put that into play. I've also got another dinosaur exhibit, which is the T-Rex, but I currently don't have any T-Rexes in my, my T-Rex paddock, okay? Uh, and then, of course, I have my hat. Now, let's just say, for example purposes, that um, my excitement level was five, okay? It's not necessarily gonna be five based on this current layout, but I'm just trying to show you an example. So based on your excitement level, if your excitement level is, let's say five, then again, from the bag, you're gonna draw a number of visitors equal to your excitement level. So I would draw five meeples from the bag. Now. There are two kinds of meeples in the bag. There are yellow ones and there are pink ones, okay? These are kind of mini meeples, but um, the yellow ones are called patrons. They are paying customers. So they're gonna get you income and victory points. 
Um, the pink ones are called hooligans. They might be purple in the retail edition, um, but um, regardless, they're hooligans. And hooligans, they sneak into your park, so they don't pay you an entry fee. And then they're the first ones to take up slots in your park. So they might fill up slots that otherwise paying customers could occupy. All right. So let's say I drew these five guys from the bag. I'm going to um, line them up at my park entrance. Again, with the hooligans being first, the hooligan's going to go in first uh, and take up a slot. Maybe I'll put them in the hat stand. You can put them in whatever open slot you want. And then the, um, you're going to determine, again, based on how many patrons you drew, that's the amount of income you're going to get for the, from your visitors for the round. So in this case, I would get $4. Okay, so I'd add that to my money. And then um, I would put these guys where I want them. Now, I could put th up to three guys in my Gallimimus exhibit because I have three dinosaurs there. Each one gets me a victory point. And maybe I want to put this guy in my gift shop, okay? Um, those are all the open slots in my park. Now, if I um, had more visitors, right, than I had open spaces, then the remaining visitors would just hang out at the entrance. If they're patrons, you still get income from them. They've all paid to get into your park. It's just that if they don't have a place to go in your park, then they're not going to earn you any victory points, all right? Now, um, so once I've got the people in my park, then I have to look at my threat level versus my security level, all right? And let's say, for example, that my security level was one less than the total threat for this round. Then if, if that was the case, one of my um, patrons in the park would get eaten. So I'd have to choose one of my patrons and he would get eaten. So I'd take him off my board and I would lose a victory point for him. So instead of gaining a victory point or gaining whatever spot, whatever benefit the spot that he was on would normally give me, I don't get any benefit from him at all other than the income and then I would lose a victory point. So that's how that works. And then um, at, once you've determined how many guys get eaten, um, whoever's left on your board, if they're patrons, they're gonna give you victory points if they're on a victory point spot. And again, if they're on like a, a food vendor, you know, tile, then, um, you know, for each guy that you, each patron that you put on a food vendor tile, you choose whether they give you $2 or one victory point. So money can be pretty tight in the early part of the game. You know, it's good to get these tiles to get income. But later in the game, you might just want, obviously, to maximize your victory points. Okay, so that's how the park phase work. Again, that happens in player order. Each player will pull from the bag, place their guys out, and determine, you know, victory points and uh, income. And you just pass the bag around the table. And then once everybody's done, you clean up. All of your visitors, you know, hooligans, patrons, they all go back in the bag. Um, everybody's workers go back to their lab board, you know, on the top of their lab board. Um, so let me get this reset back up here. Um, and so, you know, basically it would allow you to um, kind of reset the board. You're going to reset the dinosaur recipes out here to have three available dinosaurs. You're going to, you know, re-roll the dice, the DNA dice, and put those out. Reset the market. Resetting the market involves um, discarding everything in the $2 row out of the game, shifting everything else up to fill all empty spaces, and then you refill the market from the bottom. Okay, so that's the end of a round. Um, and then, uh, you've, again, you just play round after round until all but one objective cards have been claimed. Finish that round, add up your end game points, and the game is over. Um, the, the only other thing to kind of show you is, uh, again, a slight difference between retail version and deluxe version. The deluxe version comes with a number of different dinosaur meeples. Um, show you a couple examples of those. Um, so, for example, you have, you know, like Stegosaurus and Raptors, you know, T-Rex, Brontosaurus. Um, in, the, in the retail game, all of your dinosaur meeples look like um, Triceratops. Okay, so they're all the same. Again, gameplay-wise, no difference. It just, deluxe version gives you a more variety of dinosaur meeples. Um, okay, so I think that's pretty much the game. Um, if you wanted to play the game solo, it's actually quite fun. I've done it. Uh, it comes with a deck of solo cards here that um, are used to kind of drive the solo play. Um, it does work very well. You're just trying to maximize your score uh, and achieve certain objectives throughout the game. Um, so, that is Dinosaur Island. 
again by Panasaurus Games, designed by Jonathan Gilmore and Brian Lewis. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you get a chance to play the game, I hope you enjoy it. Have a great day.